All right. Well, without further ado, um, thank you for attending Charlotte Perlmongers tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to see so many new faces and so many faces from uh, from all over the world tonight. Uh, uh, MJD is talking to us tonight. Mark has been a pro uh, programming with Pearl since 1992. Uh, he's the author of a little known book called Higher Order Pearl, which is pretty awesome if you haven't mm -hmm. read it. Um, and uh, he's formerly the managing editor of Pearl.com and an occasional contributor to the Pearl Corps. And with that, uh, I thank you for coming to talk to us tonight and I hand the presentation over to you. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for inviting me and uh... Wow. Hi, folks. Uh, is it is Theron Stanford really there? All right. Maybe not. Maybe he's gone off to do whatever people in Jersey do. Uh, all right. Well, so in case you missed, I um, I have uh, I'm not going to be screen sharing the slides for reasons that I will uh, explain in a minute. Instead, you should download them from this URL that I have just pasted in the chat. Um, and unpack them on your local machine. You can also browse them online, but it'll be less awesome. So everybody knows how to unpack a tar file? Is that, should I paste the instructions? And then once you're in there. It's rm-rf, right? <laughs> rm-rf slash. Ah, OK, OK, right. sorry. And. Um, can we get like thumbs up from everybody who has finished doing that? And then I'll go ahead. Uh, 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 uh. We're still waiting for, well, we're still waiting for Enrique. He's he's not putting up his thumb. I guess I think he, he's frozen. I'm kidding. I think that's just a, I think that, <laughs> and I'm sorry. All right. Oh, this is looking really good. I'm watching the, all right. Hmm. So the origin of this talk, I'm going to start yakking, and then, then we're going to go ahead at some point. Um, the origin of this talk is that years and years ago, when I was friends with, well, I'm still friends with Nat Torkington. When I was friends with Nat Torkington, who at that time was the program director for OSCON, um, I told him about this great idea I had. I said, you know, the big problem with people who speak at conferences is they take too damn long, and they have 20 minutes of material, and they take an hour, or they have five minutes of material, and they take a half an hour. And I would like to force them to either get the point, get to the point immediately or get off the stage. And Nat said, I don't think that's a good idea. I think people really need the time that you're going to get. I don't remember what his dumb idea was. Anyway, he said he didn't think it was going to work. And I said, no, we really need five-minute talks. And maybe we need 20-minute talks. But we definitely need five-minute talks. And he said, no, we're not going to do that. So then I went to Kevin Lenzo, who was running that other Pearl conference, Yapsi, that's it. And I said, Kevin, you should give me a 60 minute slot so that I can run 60 minutes of five minute talks called lightning talks. And he said, oh yeah, sure, of course you can. And I did it and it was great. And then the next year at OSCON, Nat said to me, hey, you should do lightning talks at OSCON. And I said, well, I suggested it to you but you didn't think it was a good idea. And then he said, yes, I was wrong. I was so, so wrong. And I've treasured those words for my whole life. And so a number of years later, he said, how about if you do 12 lightning talks just yourself in an hour? And I said, okay, I can do that. And he said, we'll call it 12 views of Mark Jason Dominus. And I didn't like that so much because it seemed kind of immodest. So this is that, but except that a bunch of the talks are obsolete and I threw them away and replaced them with fresher talks. And some of them are some of them obsolete ones are still kind of in here. But talk number one, this, by the way, this, do everybody see the green guy with the lightnings on his head? Can we get a thumbs up? Does anybody need to see the slides? Okay, this is your chance to paste into the chat and say, I can't see the slides and I will figure out something else for you. Three, two, one. All right, everybody can see the slides. So, um, the, um, the rule here, uh, everybody knows that when you're giving a conference or a, um, or a, uh oh, this doesn't look good. Wait a minute. Did everybody get to page two now? Something looks unfortunate here. It's good. Give me a thumbs up yeah. if you're on page two. 
Okay. Okay. Right. So the the one thing you learn when you speak at conferences, you never, never, never want to give a live demo of your software. And here, I'm not only giving a live demo of my software, I'm giving the first ever live demo of my software, of software that I finished about two hours ago. But I thought the idea was so good, I wanted you folks to be the first to see it. So I'm going to give you a quick history of how we used to give conference talks. In the olden, olden days, you would print out your talk slides and stuff on paper. And then you would photocopy them onto sheets of clear acetate. No, I'm sorry. In the old, old, old days, you would photograph them and then have them photographically printed on little glass slides, literally glass like microscope slides, only a little bigger, sort of rectangular. And then you'd put them into a projector, which would shine a light through them onto a screen. And that's how people would see your slides. And that's why they're called slides. They're like microscope slides. Everybody good with this so far? Mm -hmm. Right. And then we got plastic. And so we started photocopying them onto plastic. And when I started conference speaking, I would photocopy my printed slides onto plastic. And then they carefully, carefully take this wide, this big, thick pile of plastic to, um, to the conference with you. And you really didn't want to lose it or drop it. Uh, because if you dropped it, and now that the sheets were all out of order, then you you know you drop it right before you have to give the talk, and then you're really sad and unhappy. Uh, and you would also mail off a copy of the printed materials to the conference organizers so they could print print them and bind them into books. Isn't that quaint? It hmm. seems like must have been a hundred years ago, but it was really only like twenty. Odd. Anyway, so you take the plastic sheets and you put them on a thing called an overhead projector that would shine a light through them, and then it would shine them on the on the screen. And then technology advanced a little more and we got LCD projectors, which were great, except that they were always attached to some computer that was at the conference venue because laptops hadn't been invented yet. Imagine that. And so then you would show up and you would have to put your, you would hopefully you'd have your slides or something on, on a disc and you'd put your disc into the computer and then you'd hope that the computer would be able to display your slides and you know maybe you had like super awesome present version 5.0, but the computer only had version 4.4, so it couldn't display your slides or something. I have this very vivid memory of going to teach a class for Tom Christensen at a large investment bank, and Tom had provided me with his display materials, which should have worked anywhere, right? Um, they were in PostScript. And uh, he said, no problem, you know, you can get a PostScript viewer. and they had a PostScript viewer on the incredibly ancient 286 machine in the conference room because people who actually do work get the new fresh machines and the old machines get cycled into the conference room so the conference speaker can talk with them. And I discovered like 16 minutes before I had to start the class that whatever was going on, the PostScript slides were all being displayed upside down. And so I was there like hand editing these postscript files with 16 minutes to go. And I said, I'm never doing this again. And if I ever have to make conference slide materials, I'm gonna make HTML because I know every computer in the world by now has a web browser and they'll all render HTML. So I did that for a while and that was working really well. And I did that for conferences for 15 or 20 years. Uh, and the HTML is a huge win uh, because you never know what shape the room is gonna be when you get into it. And God, this talk is going on so long. I'm sorry. You know, should I just cut to the chase here? Anyway, the HTML was a big win because when you, when you get to the room, you don't know how big the text needs to be for people in the back to see it, but that's okay because you can adjust it dynamically, right? If it's too small or whatever, you can make it bigger. And it's easy to stick it up on your website so that people can download it. And it doesn't look awesome and it doesn't have you know funky transitions unless you're willing to work at it, which I'm not, but I consider that a plus and not a minus. So the HTML was good. And then, then we had this Zoom thing and we started giving these conference talks and, and user talks over Zoom. And then people display the slides on their own machine, but then they screen share their screen. And that's just terrible for everybody because First off, it has to go over the video channel and the resolution is terrible. And then nobody can control how big it is or what color it is. If you know somebody has got um, vision impairment, they can't make the font any bigger. It's just, it's such a dumb solution. And we 
how to be able to do better. So the last time I gave a user talk, I just said, okay, everybody just download the slides and I'll tell you when I'm moving from page three to page four and you page through them yourselves. And if you want them to be bigger or if you want them to be displayed in different colors or whatever, you can do that and you can use your own browser and it'll behave the way you expect. And that seemed to go pretty well. And I thought this was like the greatest idea ever. And when I told my coworkers about it, a whole bunch of them had negative reactions. They said, I, I don't want to have to follow you around paging through the talk as you go from slide to slide. I just, I don't want to just sit back in my chair and watch it go. So, well, that's what I built. I hope you're on page three now because otherwise that big awesome reveal is going to be super disappointing. Um, there's a, a little server on the back end. It's a really super little server. All it does is it takes a request where somebody will ask, what page am I on? Um, and it tells them what page I'm on. Or it takes a request from me that says, I'm now on this page. And if you want to start wandering around the talk yourself because you feel like I've taken too much time to get to slide three, you can use the left and right arrows or the P and N keys if you're into that to move around the talk. And when you do, uh, a secondary number will appear in the corner to tell you uh, where I am uh, and how far I've gotten. Um, and you can click on that. It should be in gray. You can click on that to come back to where I am and resynchronize yourself. So uh, that's my new idea that's supposed to make people happy if they want to go wandering around at their own pace or if they want to sit back and just let me control the slides or if they want to do some of each. And this is my new contribution to the world. And I, I didn't, this is a really, really old talk. And I didn't want to give you a really, really old talk because it's really nice of you to invite me. And so I thought I should do something new and fresh for them that nobody has ever seen before. And this is it. And so um, I will release this on GitHub pretty soon, I think, maybe tomorrow. It's been a kind of a crazy couple of weeks. Any questions? No, one guy shakes his head. Everybody else is, is too stunned with my software wizardry here. <laughs> the, I thought it was going to be easier than it was. The back end server part was totally trivial. And then like I had to do all this JavaScript programming. Did you know this? That the browser interprets this language called JavaScript. And so you can program the browser to do stuff if you are willing to deal with JavaScript. And uh, JavaScript's kind of a mess. Mm, popular mess. Yeah, well, yeah. Because getting the browser to do stuff is useful. All right. So moving along, any questions on that before I go to the next talk? Okay, cool. Um, oh, I should have done JNK. Ah, didn't think of it. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Yeah. Yeah, who's, who, who's Bob? Who's Bob? Wait a minute. Oh, hi, Bob. Yeah, you're right. I should have done J and K. I think I did page up and page down also. I just like wasn't thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. You want to put in a pull, a pull request, I will pull it. Uh, I'll have Jason send out email with the, um, with the GitHub address once it's uploaded, because I think this is a good idea and um, that people should do it. All right. So most successful project I ever did. Um, Although I don't know, today's might be uh, might be a contender because wow, hey, it's a successful live demo. I have overcome the odds with not a minute to spare. All right, so uh, some time ago, I was dating this girl, uh, this woman who was uh, a quilter. Um, quilting is this traditional handicraft art where you take a bunch of leftover fabric and you cut it up into that you can't use for anything else, and you cut it up into small pieces, and um, then you sew the small pieces together into what are called patches. And this slide uh, demonstrates that um, four examples of patches. Um, hmm. Each of those little squares with the two triangles in it is called a half square triangle. This is a really common quilt motif. You take a couple of pieces of fabric, you cut them into triangles, you sew them together, and now you've got a square. And then you take a bunch of squares and you sew them together into what's called a patch. Uh, and uh, half square triangle Quilts are traditional in the United States. There's, there's a lot of designs for them. Um, traditional names for some of the designs, uh, corn and beans, flying geese, broken dishes are all different ways to put together these half square triangles. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, usually after you make a patch, you'll take several patches and sew them together into a larger sort of super patch called a block. Um, so here, for example, is one of the patches. Uh, and uh, I have made it into four different blocks. It's the same patch each time. I've taken four copies of the patch and sewed them together uh, into a block with rotational symmetry. And it actually turns out there's multiple ways to do that. You can see that the patch kind of has a foot shape in it. And then each of the blocks, you can see where the foot shape ended up depending on how I arranged the four patches. Is cool so far? Everybody's mm -hmm. okay, right? All right, good. All right, so, um, so these are examples of blocks. And uh, looking through my girlfriend's quilt books and looking at all the examples of blocks, I got to thinking, you know, there's a lot of blocks here, a lot of traditional ones, but I kind of wonder, it seems like there must be a lot more blocks that you don't see in the books. Uh, and so I wrote a bunch of Perl programs that systematically enumerated all of the possible blocks of this type made up of 16 half square triangle patches with uh, rotational symmetry and then I formatted them nicely and I printed them out. Uh, and then I gave them to her as a present, said, hey, look, look what I made for you. And you know, the goal of this software project was to impress my girlfriend. Um, and this was a huge success. It impressed her a lot. And then later when we got married, she made me a quilt out of the printout I had made her with all 72 of the possible quilt blocks. Uh, and there it is. And she gave it to me as a wedding present. And you can see it kind of hanging there in the background. Um, and uh, so I really like this talk because, you know, sometimes people say, ah, oh, software isn't going to help anybody with anything important. But it really turned out pretty well for me. Pro this is what Pearl Programming got me. It got me that cake and the beautiful woman standing next to the cake. And uh, then there's an update since the last time I gave this talk, which is uh, these guys. Uh, also came along. And so uh, in some sense, they were partly generated by this Perl program. You're supposed to laugh at that. Somebody say, ha ha. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I was on mute. That's OK. Um, I laughed, I was on mute. OK. All right, all right. I'm, I'm mollified. It's, this is why Zoom talks are hard. You can't actually <laughs> see the audience. So you don't know, like, are they even looking at me? Or are they watching, you know, Britney Spears and some other window? Do people do that anymore? Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's my most successful software project ever. And uh, I am to this day very, very proud of it. All right, this is an ancient, ancient talk, as you can see um, from the timestamp in, uh, in this message here, which I think actually is an excerpt of a Usenet message, which tells you just how old and dusty it is. Um, Someone says, well, I'm writing a Perl script and I want to do the equivalent of grep minus IC, and, uh, but I would like to use a, a built-in function in Perl instead. And this guy, uh, whoever was replying here, uh, I have erased his name to protect the guilty, said, oh, good idea. You should never shell out of a Perl script if you can avoid it. And it, at that time, and still, people are always like, yeah, you can do that in Perl without shelling out. Now, the program that made my slides, it makes a whole lot of shell calls. Um, it, it takes the file where I put all the slide stuff and it splits it up into multiple text files. And then for each text file, it runs a program on it that converts it to HTML in a really terrible way. Uh, and the conversion is fairly slow. Um, so it does the conversion only if the text version, the plain text version has changed. So it extracts the text version out of my most recent draft. It compares it with the one that it converted last time. And if they're identical, it just skips the conversion this time. If they're not identical, it, it does the conversion, which is a, a lot of Perl. Um, and so there's the, there's the typical conversion code. Um, if the um, backup version of the text file doesn't exist, uh, or if the CMP command, everybody know the Unix CMP command? Let me get a thumbs up or thumbs down. CMP just compares two files. Right, okay, good, we're good. Let's see if they're identical. Um, then it prints out a star and it puts the file on the list of things that need to be regenerated. Um, and um, 
I had a big argument at the time with people on IRC about this. They're like, oh, come on, you're calling out to the shell. Why are you calling CMP? You could do that in Perl directly. Just load the file into memory, do the string compare. Why are you shelling out, man? And my first answer to that was, because this is one line of code and your thing is going to be, I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's going to be more than one line of code. And they said, yeah, but it's, it's inefficient. And I said, I don't know, maybe. And some of them went even farther. They said, oh, but you could just you should be keeping a checksum of each file. And then you can compare the checksums instead of running CMP over the entire file every time. And that sounded like even more work to me. And the computer's really good at doing stupid work. Why do I have to program the computer mm -hmm. to make it more efficient at doing boring work that I don't want to do? I would rather not program the computer to do that and write system CMP and then go off and eat ice cream while the computer is doing the CMPs. Well, anyway, um, I we went back and forth and we kept talking past each other. The extreme programming people say the simplest, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. And I really like that motto because I'm really lazy and I'm not actually that bright. And so I would, I'm also, well, mostly just lazy. And, you know, Larry once said, Larry Wall said that, that a good program is one that gets the job done before your boss fires you. <laughs> and I really get behind that. <laughs> If I'm writing my own program, maybe I want to write it to be good. But no, usually I just want it to do what it's supposed to do. And then I want to go and like hang with my kids or something. So anyway, CMP was the simplest thing that could possibly work. And it did work. Uh, and so those people in me had the, we never did resolve the argument. But, you know, they were making an efficiency argument. And so here, I'm going to get the last word on the efficiency argument. <clears throat> um, to do the CMP requires that you fork a new process and then exec CMP. And then possibly you've got to read both files, um, the, uh, the old one and the current one and compare them byte by byte. Um, so that's, that's the cost of my approach. And the MD5 suggestion would require one open um, to read the current file and compute its checksum. Um, so the benefit from the MD5 is one open, save it would, wouldn't have to do the fork, it wouldn't have to do the exec, and it wouldn't have to read the old version of the file because it would have the checksum hanging around. But the cost there is that you have to do a lot of processing to calculate an MD5 checksum. There's a lot of computation there, byte by byte. And it turns out calculating checksums is fairly expensive. And I got curious enough that I went ahead and implemented the MD5 thing and discovered, oh, this is actually slower than just shelling out and running CMP. So, um, so not only were they wrong, they were also very wrong. One of Perl's big selling points is that it was a glue language. Uh, it's good for sticking together pieces of things. And if you don't want to write something yourself, maybe there's a Unix utility that'll do it for you. Or maybe you're trying to get program A to talk to program B. This has always been one of Perl's big selling points. And so I don't get why these people on IRC had such a thing about don't use Perl for what it's good for, which is talking to other programs and getting them to do the work. And then another thing we used to say part of the, the Perl pitch was, well, Perl isn't, great, isn't really fast, but it might be fast enough. You can write a quick prototype, and it might be that the quick prototype runs efficiently enough that you don't have to replace it. Uh, and well, you know, one way to get a quick prototype is to not do all the MD5 stuff yourself by hand, just shell out to CMP and see if it's fast enough that you don't need to replace it. So I did that. And the thing still uses CMP, and it's still probably faster than doing the checksum. It used to take a couple of seconds, maybe, which was enough. And now it's instantaneous, and I can just run through 70 slides in a second. So Moore's Law, Moore's Law got me a win there anyway. Hmm. Anyway, let's not forget what's good about the languages that we use. All right. This is a picture of me at Yapsi at the first Yapsi, I think. I had uh, given a, yeah, here I am again, same thing. Oh yeah, I see what's going on here, right? So I had given a talk at the Lisa conference in San Diego and I said, okay, but 
I can do your release of talk, but it's really, really important that you schedule my talk for as early as possible on Sunday because I have to fly to Pittsburgh and speak at Yapsi by Wednesday. And they said, oh, absolutely, we will schedule as early as possible on Sunday. And then they scheduled me for Tuesday afternoon. So after my Lisa talk in San Diego, I rushed to the airport and hopped on the red eye flight and flew to Pittsburgh and got to Pittsburgh at like six in the morning. And then I said to Kevin Lenzo, I had said to Kevin Lenzo, can you please not schedule me for Wednesday and please schedule me only for Thursday because I'm going to be coming in from San Diego. And he said, no problem. But I got there really, really early on Wednesday morning. And he said, oh, Joe Hall was snowed in in Chicago and he can't come today. Could you take over his two, three hour slots today? And I had just gotten off the red eye, so I didn't say no. And then I gave my, gave my like two ad-libbed three hour talks to replace Joe. And then I gave my tutorial talks on the following day. And then I did what you see here and lay down on the floor in the hallway and went to sleep with my hat on my face. And that shirt is from the San Diego Lisa conference. I'm probably the only person in the world who was at both of those conferences because they happened within three days of each other. I don't know why I took so long on that. I'm sorry. Hey, Jason, how long is this talk supposed to take? I'm supposed to be done in like an hour, right? Uh, give or take. All right, I'll step it up a little. Here I am asleep on the floor in Vienna uh, at the Vienna Yapsi, and somebody put down a... Um, put down a, a sheet of paper that said that I am a PHP programmer, please help me. And people put down these one euro coins. And when I woke up, there were these, there was this like pile of seven or eight euros next to me because people <laughs> were taking pity on me. Um, I have narcolepsy. And so I fall asleep in weird places a lot. All right. Oh, I really like, like this talk. This is, <clears throat> this is fairly fresh. Well, okay. So Perl objects are usually based on hashes, right? And you have an object, and mm -hmm. the object is really a hash, and you use the keys to store the member data, which is the values. Everybody's familiar with this, right? I should mm -hmm. get a whole lot of thumbs here for this. Yeah, all right, good, right. But we all know arrays are smaller and faster than hashes. Um, and so you could use an array and say, put the color red into slot number seven. That'll be the color slot uh, instead of uh, calling it the, using the key color. But if you do that, of course, the code is completely unreadable. Right. Um, so here's typical code, right? It's a package called fruit. Um, what's going on here? Oh no, I see. Okay, so sorry, I skipped the uh, I skipped the explanation here. Uh oh. Um, somebody got this. Am I still here? We're good, right? Yeah. Okay. So somebody got the bright idea back sometime in the early 2000s, I think. Hey, here's a thought. Suppose you've got an object, or you've got a class called fruit, and the objects are going to be based on arrays. Okay. But you declare up front what the array elements are going to be used for. So for example, you're going to say, okay, array element seven is color. And that's what that use fields declaration is going to be about. And then later on, if you declare some variable like dollar self to be a fruit, Perl will know, oh yeah, okay, this object, this variable is gonna hold an object. It's gonna be based on an array, but we're gonna pretend in the source code that it's based on a hash. And the person there is gonna say self arrow color. But what that really means is I'm supposed to look in for a use fields declaration, find out that self arrow color really means self arrow seven and access element seven of this array. So you can pretend in the source that it's a hash, even though it's really an array and get the benefits of readable source code. You say arrow color instead of arrow seven, but the efficiency of the array, the space and time savings of the array. Is that clear or should I explain in any more detail? Hmm. Hmm. Any, anybody remember this? You got a thumbs down, mm -hmm. thumbs up? Hmm, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, all right, well, anyway. So, um, oh, here I am explaining it again, all right. Yeah, right, so you say my fruit and then you declare the variable. That means it's gonna be from the class fruit. Um, the, wow, I skip a slide here, there's a, 
No, 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 no. Yeah, okay, what? right. So this is how it actually gets stored here. Um, the member data gets stored in elements one, two, three, four. Zero is reserved. Color will be in slot seven. And then zero has actually a hash that maps the field names to the slot numbers for a reason that we're going to... Um, Man, I, yeah, I did skip something. I wonder what happened to this. Mm -hmm, mm. Yeah. Well, I should have put a better hash in here, a better, a better slide in here. All right, so that at compile time, if everything works out properly and you've declared the variable and you have the fields declaration and you wrote this variable accessing uh, as access as if it were a hash, then Perl at compile time can resolve that to an array reference and say, oh, okay, you wrote arrow color but I know that what you really meant is arrow seven, and that's good. The problem is Perl might not know the hash key at compile time, right? The hash key might be in a variable and it can't possibly access know at compile time to convert that to seven. So what it does in that case is this thing here that's in purple um, that says, okay, well, if I don't know the hash key at compile time, what I will do is I will assume the object contains element zero that maps the key names to the slot numbers. And then at runtime, I'll take the key you gave me, I'll look it up in that mapping hash that's in element zero. So I'll get fruit zero, that's the map. And then I'll look up the key, that's color, and it'll give me back the number seven. And I'll use that as an index into fruit, get element seven, which is red. Is that okay? So that's what you have to do in runtime. And the hope was that the common case is that the 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 key is known at compile time, so you get the fast array access instead of the slow array, then hash, then array access. That was the hope. Question so far? All right, well, anyway, it got more and more complicated. It turned out, you know, when you like make a change to a large programming system and then you discover that you can't make that change without making another two changes, and then each of those causes you to have to redesign something else, and it just gets more and more and more complicated. And really good programmers will stop at some point and say, okay, no, this is no good. We got to give up and reconsider the whole plan. And not quite so good programmers who are really, really impressed with their own cleverness will just keep going. It's like, I can solve that problem. That's what I do. I'm an engineer. I solve problems. And if solving that problem creates two more problems, so much the better because then I can solve those. They're like, like a, a guy driving a car on a road through the forest and then they drive off the road and bump into a tree. And they say, no problem, I got an ax in the trunk. And they go get the ax and chop down the tree. And then they drive five feet more and then bump into another tree. No problem, I'll just use my ax. And pro programmers have lots of axes. And it never occurs to some of these folks that they gotta drive back and get back on the road. Anyway, I'm sorry, that was a digression. The feature got more and more complicated. I uh, had all sorts of weird implications, like fruit looks like a hash. So what happens if somebody calls delete on it or exists? Uh, and at that point, right, the jig is up because it's not really a hash. It's an array. You got to do something and you could throw a runtime exception, say, no, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. But in 2007, the pumpkin said, oh, well, I ended up having to, I had, I, had an, I had to get the ax out of the trunk and hack down these two trees. So delete and exists had to, had to work for arrays in, in addition to hashes. And it, it's really not clear what it means for exists to work on an array. And then if you use delete on the array, well, okay, the element gets set to undef, but then does exists return true or false? And then there had to be like array elements that were undef, but they did exist, and array elements that were undef, but they didn't exist. Does anybody remember this? It was a dark time for the Perl community. Yeah. Oh, it was just really bad. I don't remember who this dog is, but they look really angry. That's about how I felt about it at the time. Um, all right. So I felt that at that, that was the point at which it should have been clear that pseudo hashes were a bad idea. And I thought it was clear. Many other people thought it was clear. Um, but Sarathi, the release manager, and Larry, the benevolent dictator for life, were at that time possessed by malevolent aliens. And uh, Perl 560 underwent a feature freeze. Uh, and uh, then 
Sarathi and Larry put in this like exists and delete in for arrays after the so-called feature freeze, uh, which I guess you can do if you're Larry, but kind of spoils the whole idea of a feature freeze. And uh, Larry said, no, it's okay, because it's not actually a change, whatever that means. I See what I mean about the malevolent aliens? Tom Christensen argued against it uh, quite extensively on Pearl Five Porters. And the end of the discussion, I this is a literal quotation, Larry told Tom to shut up. He said, give it a rest, Tom. I can hunt up the, the message if you want. I was startled at the time. And I thought Tom was right. Um, but Larry told him to shut up. So, all right. So what can we learn from all this? Uh, this is probably when I should have started ranting about the programmer who loves to solve problems and doesn't realize he should get back on the road instead of chopping down a tree every five feet. I've got a blog post about this that I wrote. I call this kind of thing a pickle slicer. Because it's like, Every once in a while, some programmer shows up and says, hey, let's all stick a part of our body in a pickle slicer. And everybody, instead of saying, no, I don't think that would be a good idea, everybody lines up to do it. And this was a pickle slicer if ever I saw one. And everybody lined up to do it. And then at some point, there's a, a coda to this that isn't in the slides, which is several years after that, well, it did turn out to speed up uh, speed up object accesses, in, at least in the case where you knew the key at compile time, by like 15%. So maybe it had been worth all the suffering, all the toil, the changes to the documentation, the confusion to beginners who now have to understand that an array element could be undef but define uh, exists, but undef and not exists. Then somebody got the right idea finally, six or seven years later, Somebody compared object access in the good case, not with object access in the bad case, but with object access in a version of Perl that didn't have pseudo hashes at all. He ripped out all the pseudo hash material from Perl 5.8 or something and ran the same tests and discovered that the pseudo hash code in Perl was so pervasive that it made every Perl operation, every Perl operation 15% slower. Hmm. everything. The interpreter ran 15% slower. And that in that best possible case where all the ducks were lined up and you declared the fields and you declared the variable and you knew the key at compile time, the 15% gain was just enough to get you back to zero. And that was the end of pseudo hashes. It then took a few more years. They had to undergo a deprecation cycle. Then they had to be taken out of the code and the whole thing was all for nothing. I'm going to cry. It's terrible. <laughs> Some of the smartest programmers I've ever worked with were working on the Perl core at this time. And wow, we all just blew it. I wish I had a, uh, I wish I had something more optimistic to say at the end. Okay. So with the moral of the story, don't do that. Okay. All right. New talk. Well, wow, they're taking like 10 minutes each. At this rate, it's going to be like two hours. We'll have to skip some. Do I want to do this talk? I'm not even sure I do. Uh, uh, uh. No, we're not going to. Maybe we'll have a, we have an intermission. Hmm. Did you guys get the um, the intermission illustrations? I might have forgotten to put them in the tar file. Do you have a dancing hot dog? No. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. Well, we'll have to fix it later. All right. This is a better talk anyway. Um, this one, hmm, is this gonna work? For this one, I am gonna share the screen cause I'm not sure it's gonna work with my awesome software cause I put it in a subdirectory uh, and subdirectories are hard. So let me see, how do I do this? Um, rename, pin, share screen, desktop one, debugging, here we go, share. All right, is my screen sharing working? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, everybody's got debugging the brain sequence. Yes. I just needed to take all these slides and insert them into the other ones, but then I didn't. And 
So here we are. All right. Um, oh yeah, this talk has no words. So uh, that makes it work even worse on Zoom than, um, so I used to give this in person at lightning talk sessions, but I can see the audience. I can like wave my arms and stuff. This is terrible. And then the alternative is just to read the slides to you. You know what? This is a bad idea. You can look at them on your own time. They should be in the tar file. We are just going to skip this. This is just not going to work. I'm sorry. Ugh. The lightning has struck. What? The lightning has struck? Yep. What's that mean? Well, it was supposed to be lightning talks, but you were going slow. And so now you've gone through three, you know, zippity quicks. So I'm saying oh, the lightning. Yeah. Right. True. That to brain talk is good. I, I, I give it, I, yeah, I put everything on the slides and then like, I could just read them out loud, but I wouldn't, I would just go through them and wave my arms, shrug occasionally, make faces. And then uh, some joker recorded this uh, at, a, at some conference and put it online with the rest of the audio. It was an audio only recording. And so I think I still got a copy of this. It went over pretty well. All right, anyway. Um, so a couple of jobs ago, this is now, yeah, a couple, a couple of jobs ago, three or four, I had this web page and I needed to draw some lines for it. Like, is everybody, uh, is this working again? Are we back on uh, on slide 29 or something here? It's good. I'm, I'm on, I'm still stuck on 28. Oh, hey, look at that. Me too. How did that happen? Hold on a second. Oh, <laughs> funny. How about now? 29. All right. Yeah, so I have two windows open. One is the uh, the leader, and one is the follower because I have to test. And you guys are all followers. And then uh, when I went back to the browser, I went into the follower window and moved to the next slide. And so it didn't tell anybody else about that. All right, this is fun. Okay, well anyway, so I needed to draw these lines. Um, and uh, I just needed to put together a few of these like trivial line diagrams like this thing. I tried a whole bunch of Linux diagramming tools at the time uh, and they sucked and none of them worked and they were all really hard. And I was like, I just wanna draw a line. I don't wanna worry about the object mask or I can't remember what. There was just so many things that went wrong. Somebody said, why, don't, why didn't you use GIMP? And I said, well, I did use GIMP but I couldn't find the tool that draws straight lines. Uh, and somebody said, why didn't you use this? And I said, well, I didn't know about that. Somebody said, why didn't you use this? And I said, I tried to use that, but it, I can't remember. The output format was in like XPM mode. I, I don't remember. It was terrible. And I tried writing it in Perl, write a program in Perl to draw line draw drawings like this. And it still sucked, but it did work. And it got the job done before my boss fired me. Uh, and now I'm going to show you how it worked. The idea is, First, I send it a little ASCII input uh, to describe the shape of the thing I wanted with vertical bars to mean vertical strokes and hyphens to mean horizontal strokes and less than and greater than to mean T intersections. So, and then it would produce that output. Um, the only, only clever part of this program is that it would emit its output in this format called PBM, which is portable bitmap format. Who's heard of this? You get hands? A couple of people. It is literally the simplest possible bitmap format. That's, that's an example PBM file right there. The P1 is a magic number so that a program reading the file can know that it's a PBM file. Then the uh, 1010 means that what follows is gonna be an array of 10 by 10 bits. Uh, and then the uh, ones and zeros, which can be separated by any amount of white space or none are the bits. Um, I could show you what the bitmap looks like that corresponds to that file, but I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. Uh, so what do you do with a PBM file? Well, uh, it's such a simple format that anybody who comes up with their own graphics format will immediately write a program that convert it to PBM and convert PBM to their format. So for example, if you get the reference implementation of JPEG, uh, it includes a program called CJPEG that takes a PBM file and turns it into a JPEG. And then there's a DJPEG that goes the other way. And if you have a PNG library, there's gonna be a utility program in there that converts PBMs to PNGs. Or if there isn't, you can hack one up really quickly because the input format is just so very simple. 
Uh, so my program would emit its output in PBM format, but then it would just run it through a pipe, uh, which would go through to see JPEG and it didn't have to know anything about JPEGs. It just had to, right there we are using Perl as a glue language, sending stuff through CJPEG and the output turns out to be a JPEG file. Uh, and then it prints out the P1, which is the, uh, the magic number. Uh, it prints out uh, W and H, which are the width and the height in bits. And then it prints a bunch of, um, of uh, bit strings. That's not the whole program, of course, but that's the business end of it. Any questions? It's good. All right. Uh, so how does the rest of the program work? Well, it reads the input uh, one line at a time, chops the new lines off. Uh, w is the, uh, is the width in bits, and uh, that's equal to the length of the first line. Really, it should be equal to the length of the longest line, but I wanted to get it done a little bit faster. So I said, all right, all the lines have to be the same length, and they all have to be padded with white space on the right if they're not. And uh, doing that traded me off for some logic here. And then H is the height of the thing in, in bits, which is the number of lines it's read. And then it just converts the ASCII to bits and pushes that onto the output array. How do you do the convert? Uh, the convert splits an input line into characters. Uh, it converts the characters one at a time uh, into uh, a bunch of, um, of rows of bits. It appends the rows of bits onto the result and then it returns the result. And then the convert is basically just interpret the characters. Um, the character is in shift. Uh, shift is uh, is the argument. And then there's a bunch of pattern matches to decide if the character, like say it's a less than sign. You want it to have a line that comes out of the left and out of the top and out of the bottom, but not out of the right. And so there's these up, down, left, right variables uh, and uh, up, left, and down turn out to be true because you can see the less than signs in there, but uh, right is false. Uh, and then it just puts together a bunch of strings of ones and zeros and it returns an array of those strings. Uh, and then that's, that's Perl. Um, and I think it's kind of awesome that you can get this kind of thing done in Perl in, with that little work. And, um, you know, people I've showed this program to said, well, why didn't you just, and the answer is, well, cause I'd already tried, why didn't you just two or three times and none of them worked well. And it had used up 30 or 40 minutes of my life and writing this program took about 20 minutes and then I moved on and here we are. So Perl's not always just quick drying shit squeezed out of a tube, but this program definitely is. It's terrible, uh, but sometimes quick drying shit is what you need. And I'm really proud of this program because it got the job done before my boss fired me. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good quote for the day. What? Get the job done before your boss fires you? No, not just quick drying shit in the tube. Not just, yeah, not always, but, but this time it was. And sometimes <laughs> that's a good thing. You know, you get your thing done, it's done in 30 minutes, it's dry and only smells bad a little bit. <laughs> not every program has to be a diamond like jewel <laughs> polished to perfection. All right. Oh, we're gonna, well, I don't know if this one is, this is why this will never win. Well, I'm, I wrote this thing like 20 years ago and my prediction came true, but by this time it's not a very interesting prediction. So let's just skip over this one. All right, ooh, get rebase. This is good. This is still current. I like this. Um, one of the things that I have become to my surprise over the last few years is a Git expert, um, which is rewarding in some ways. It's another one of those things where it's like got a whole lot of problems. And so it's got solutions for those problems that introduce their own problems. I wish, I'm really in a bad mood today. I'm sorry, guys. I wish I were in a more cheerful mood. I had an optimistic feeling about software. I had something good to say about it, but gosh, doesn't it all just suck? Well, hey, at least my page turning thing works okay. All right. Only when it doesn't work. Only when it doesn't work software. No, it's bad even when it does work. <laughs> it's just a little bit less bad. All right. So people who are not interested in Git should go to sleep for the next five minutes. Um, this is, well, actually, who knows how Git rebase actually works? Can I get hands? Okay. So who uses Git? Hands, please. Okay, almost everybody. So cool, this is good. Git rebase is really, really useful. 
And it's probably the most useful intermediate level Git tool. Like it's not the thing you should learn when you're first learning Git, but it's definitely one of the first things you should learn once you're used to Git. And it's really good. And it, it seems complicated and it turns out it's actually quite simple once you know what it's doing. Uh, and that's the secret with understanding Git is you gotta know what it's doing because what it's doing is never very much. And then, and the model is simple and clear and straightforward. And then piled on top of that simple, clear, straightforward model is this enormous festering garbage heap of inconsistent interfaces and poor terminology and confusing options. And, but if you can dig down to the core, you find a good part. So, okay. So first we have to understand cherry picking. Um, here we've got a branch and the commits that are on master are red and somebody has checked out a, a, a work branch called topic and made a new commit that's blue, uh, which is different from the last commit on master. Everybody cool with this so far? All right, so now suppose we have master checked out and we say git cherry pick topic, what's that do? Well, first does the, finds the diffs between topic and whatever the parent commit is, that red one right there at the fork. And then it tries to apply the diffs to whatever you currently have checked out, in this case, master. So it just applies the diffs as a patch. It's just a patch. Uh, and if the patch succeeds, it commits the result using the old commit message from topic. That's all. So it says, okay, find the changes between that commit and its parent, try to apply them here. If that works, commit and reuse the commit message. So it's, uh, it's kind of like make a commit that's like topic, but make it here instead of where it actually is. And if you can use the same commit message. Everyone cool with that? Hmm. That's good. Okay, who didn't know that yet? Can I get hands? Okay, a couple of people. All right. Um, you can also tell it, oh, um, don't actually do the commit at all. Just apply the patch and leave the results staged in the index. Uh, or you can say, okay, proceed with the commit reuse the commit message, but let me edit it. That's minus E. Uh, so it's got about this, pretty much the same options as regular commit. All right, so that's cherry pick. Git rebase is nothing except a loop around git cherry pick. It's just a repeated cherry pick. So say we're on topic here, we've got a whole lot of commits since the last place, last time we were on master, which is that square red commit. Now we check out master. Oh, sorry. Now we say, I want to rebase topic onto master. What does it do? First, it checks out master and it finds the last common ancestor between topic and master. That's the red commit where the branch occurred. And then it cherry picks all five of the blue commits, one after the other. And then if that all succeeds, then it takes topic and it points it to the last cherry picked commit. So it's basically copying those blue commits onto the current master. Just does them one at a time. Find a patch, try to patch the current head. And if that works, commit the result and reuse the commit message. Then find the next patch, apply that and commit it. Next commit, next commit, patch commit. Now you've done all five, then it moves topic to the new commits, the new blue commits and checks it out again. Okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So let's just copy these commits and then move the ref if that works. And then there's this frightening option called git rebase minus I, which is interactive, where you can do all kinds of weird stuff. Like you can reorder the order of the cherry picks and say, no, 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 don't pick them in the order that they were made, one, two, three, four, five, pick them in this different order, three, one, two, five, four. And it just reorders the cherry picks says, okay, I'll pick them in the order you said instead of in the order I was going to. You can discard a commit along the way just by deleting it from the list of cherry picks. You can squash two commits into one uh, using a, a squash command. What does that do for real inside of git rebase? Oh, all it does is that after it's done the patch and it has the stuff staged in the index, it doesn't do the commit. Instead, it just tries to apply the next patch before doing the commit. So you want to squash two commits together. Normally it would do patch, commit, patch, commit. Instead, now it does patch, patch, commit. You can pause to amend a commit. That's just using cherry pick minus N where it doesn't do the committing and then it just stops and waits for you. You can rewrite the log message. Uh, there it's just using minus E, which means after you, or while you're doing the commit, 
pause to edit, edit the, uh, the, the log message, you should check it out. Um, the code is not complicated. It's really long. It's hairy. It's a shell script. But probably 90% of it is option processing, like <clears throat> to deal with the command line flags or whatever. There's this function in there called do next, which says, OK, I'm going to do the next patch. I'm going to do the next cherry pick. And it looks to see what command you gave it. And if there's a command there that says um, reward, it just does the cherry pick just like always, but it gives it minus E. And if it's squash, it does a cherry pick just like always, but it gives it minus N. So it's a, a large amount of code that's not important wrapped around this tiny little kernel of which is just a loop around cherry pick. It's worth taking a look at. Any questions before I go on? No, it's good. Let's see. This is. <laughs> Hmm. This is just a whole lot of ranting. We'll come back to this if, um, <laughs> if uh, I don't hmm. know, we're kind of over time anyway. I forget if what comes after this is better or worse. Let me take a look. Uh, also, because it involves a lot of swearing. Oh yeah, this is much better anyway. I like this a lot. This is here. We're going to have to do screen sharing, but this time it's actually going to work. So uh, I think. Let's see. All right. Well, <clears throat> hold on one second. Hmm. How do I do this? Share screen. Desktop. Wait. I don't want that. I want that. Doop. Can we see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, hmm. a number of years ago, a pair of French Canadian astrophysicists. Um, got this idea to send a message to the aliens. They, um, they prepared this, uh, this series of bitmaps, which they then had sent out of, um, of a radio telescope, telescope in Epitoria, Ukraine. This is similar to the Arecibo message that was sent out of the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, if you have heard of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But this one is longer and more detailed. So there's these 23 bitmaps, uh, and this is the first one. Um, the, uh, the little O's and X's in the upper left and upper right corner are page number. It's binary number one. Uh, you can't see because my display has a black background, but there's a, a, a frame around the, uh, around the picture, uh, which is uh, 127 by 127 bitmap. Uh, the idea being since the aliens are only going to be getting the bits one at a time, they need to know how to resolve them into rectangles. 127 is prime. And if you get a sequence of bits, that's 127 by 127 by 23. There's only a couple of ways to turn it into a sequence of rectangles. Um, and then the border around each page is going to help you figure out that, oh, okay, well, clearly these are page boundaries. The uh, funny looking glyph in the top middle, I think means mathematics. So they had to decide on a language to communicate to the aliens what they were trying to say. And they invented this thing based on these glyphs that are five bits by seven. And each glyph, can you, you guys can't see my, um, my mouse pointer when I wave it around, right? Yes, I can. Oh, you can. Oh, yeah. that is so fortunate. All right. So they wanted the, the Transmitting stuff to the stars is, is very error prone and you're likely to lose big chunks of your message. So they, um, they wanted to use these big glyphs where if you randomly changed a bunch of the bits in a glyph, it wouldn't look like some other glyph. Um, so this thing that looks like an upside down L, that's the glyph for the number one. Mm -hmm. And this page is explaining how numbers work. This thing in the upper left here says that if you've got no dots, that's equal to this binary number zero. And here's the glyph for zero. It looks kind of like a zero. Uh, and that helps people who are preparing the message do, uh, do proofreading because it looks zero-ish. And then this next one says one dot is binary number one. And this is the glyph for one. And then this is the glyph for two. It looks vaguely two-ish. And then this is the glyph for three, vaguely three-ish. The way they made up the glyphs is they made them up at random, uh, but subject to the constraint that no two of them could have too many bits in common. And then they picked out glyphs that looked kind of like the things they needed to represent. So the three looks vaguely three-ish. The four doesn't look anything like a four, but it does have four horizontal lines. So that's something. The five is a tiny bit like a five. The six is almost like a six, except it's backwards. And the seven, hey, a seven is a seven. How about that? So this is a kind of a clever idea. Oh, yeah. And this thing that is an equal sign looks kind of like an equal sign. So uh, 
I first saw this in some book about human alien communication. I only saw this one bitmap and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I have to figure this out. And then if you go to the trouble of figuring out the thing at the bottom, has anybody figured out the thing at the bottom? I can't see you raise your hands at this point. It has, if I can, I can share my screen, but I can't look at you guys. So somebody mentioned ooh, in the, uh, in ooh. Ooh, 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 Gizmos figured it out. It's That's right. <laughs> Just in case the aliens were wondering if they got it right, it's a list of prime numbers. It says 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and then uh, all the way up through 89. And then this thing at the bottom um, has glyphs that aren't explained, but they, they come later. They're explained later. It says it's 2 to the power of 3, 0, 2, 1, 3, 7, 7, minus 1, which at the time was the largest prime number known. Man, I should have known that. What's that? I should have known that. <laughs> okay. I'm. Uh, I, I participate in the Gibbs project, which finds those numbers. Right. Sure. But well, this 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 was pretty long ago, so maybe you wouldn't have been. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't have recognized it. But you know, in the context, it's not that hard to figure out. I often wonder what the aliens' response to this is going to be. Is it going to be like? Are they gonna be like, oh, look at how cute you are. You've got your like cute little prime there. Or is it gonna be like, well, how do you, you think that's prime? What do you think about, Wah! how could you possibly know that? Or maybe, maybe they won't, maybe they'll just know. Uh, anyway, hmm. so there are, um, there are 23 of these pages and it's a really fun exercise if you wanna sit down in the evening and go through a bunch of them. Um, it starts off with that basic mathematics and then page two is about arithmetic. It's explaining, um, these are all addition problems. So it says here one plus one equals two. And since you already know what one equals and two mean, you can figure out what plus means. And here's one plus two equals three. Here's three plus two equals five. And then these are minuses. These are multiplications. Here's a bunch of divisions and some things involving decimal points. Um, so here's one divided by 11, which is equal to 0 0.0909. This thing means a dot, 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 I guess. Uh, and then what happens on page three? Page three is about exponentiation, at which point you can understand the Mersenne prime that's on the first slide. So these are like powers of this and that. Eventually it moves on towards more interesting stuff. Let's see, page six here. These are pictures of hydrogen and oxygen atom, uh, sorry, hydrogen and helium atoms. And I think it gives the, uh, the atomic mass of each of them. Um, and then these are explaining the atomic masses of various elements, uh, except for uh, this one, I believe, which uh, is gets the atomic mass of uranium wrong. Uh, yeah, that was kind of embarrassing. So I often wonder sometimes if the aliens are gonna come back and be like, well, so this thing that you told us about the uranium 217, is that really a thing or did you just screw up? And we're gonna have to say, uh, yeah, of course that's a thing. Don't you have uranium 217? Let me see, one of these is, uh, here's a picture of the solar system. So here's the sun, the planets are approximately to scale, although the distances obviously are not. Um, this symbol here means the sun. This is explaining the mass of the sun in terms of uh, kilograms, I think, which were explained earlier in terms of like a number of hydrogen atoms. Uh, and then this symbol here means the Earth. It's annotated next to the Earth there. Um, they have a symbol for Jupiter because they figure the aliens might be familiar with Jupiter because it's easier to see from far away. Where's my favorite page? This is my favorite page. Here the aliens are explaining about what our planet is actually like. Uh, and they say, well, it has a, an Earth part with mountains on it and the mountains plunge into the sea and the sea is this wavy line here. And how are the aliens gonna know this is Earth and this is the sea and this is an atmosphere? Well, these are chemical descriptions. This says silicon, oxygen, oxygen, so silicon dioxide. And I think this is um, iron two oxide and this is aluminum two oxide. And this is, I forget what that is, some other thing that you're likely to find in, in dirt. Uh, and then up here we've got uh, nitrogen two, oxygen two, argon, carbon dioxide. Um, and down here, this is hydrogen, oxygen, H2O, sodium and chlorine. So they know what these three regions are made of. Um, they know that the land is made of these, um, these minerals and then the air is made of these gases and the water is, is water. Uh, and then this ruler here is the height of the land. It's the height of Mount Everest. 
this ruler here is the depth of the ocean. That's the depth of the um, of the Mariana Trench. I think eleven thousand meters or something. Um, and uh, I think this I forget what this thing is with the sevens and nines in it. So the the thing I really like about this page is first off it tells the aliens where we live. Look, there's these little stick figures here, and this is the glyph for people. So these are the people, they live on the land, not, they don't fly through the air like birds or swim like fish. They live on the land by the mountains. And then the other thing I love about this picture is, what do we do if the aliens get it upside down? They might be really confused, but they can't get it upside down because this thing over on the right, who knows what this is? No? This is a picture of a falling object accelerating under gravity and it's falling in a parabola shape. So if you drop a ball, it's gonna fall like this. And this is the glyph for acceleration. And so it's showing you that things accelerate as they move towards this edge of the picture, not towards any of the other edges. So the aliens can't turn it sideways because the acceleration is towards the bottom edge. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. I thought that was so clever. That looks well, like anyway. an XKCD comic. It is kind of, yeah, only for aliens. Let's see, what else have we got? This is a it's kind of a copy of the Voyager plate with the pictures of the humans waving on it. It says how big the humans are. And with any luck, the aliens will be able to match that up with the stick figures on the previous slide. There's another one of these parabolas to show which is the bottom end of the humans and which is the top end. Um, and then this is explaining DNA chemistry a little bit. And this thing here is about fried eggs. No, that's a cell. It's got the DNA in the nucleus. I don't know if the aliens are going to get that. There's a map of the Earth. That's the bottom half. That's the top half. No, wait. Well, there's some halves anyway. This is explaining about how we sent the message with a picture of the radio telescope at the bottom. And then the last slide is like, this is the symbol for, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure because it isn't explained very well in the earlier pages, but I think it means it means what? So this is the page about what? And they're like, what about the elements? And what about mass and energy? And this is what universe? And this is asking about like, what about the aliens planet? And this is asking about, I think, what about our planet? Uh, and so it's kind of fun. You read through. I used to put slide number one up on um, on the screen during the intermissions in, um, in tutorial classes to give people something to think about when they came back from lunch. Uh, and then... I thought I'd show it to you and you can download them and have fun trying to figure them out. Or you can just read the series of 25 blog posts that I wrote explaining what everything means, uh, which I had planned to do for 15 years and I never did. And then, then I did it. And oh, hey, here's my optimistic end of my talk. The optimistic end of my talk is that when you reach middle age, you realize that all the stuff you said you were going to do as a kid um, that you never got around to, some of it actually you did eventually get around to amazingly and so like, not, not everything is terrible uh, anyway that's my talk I will be happy to answer questions and uh, thank you very much for inviting me Very Thank good. you. That was yeah. awesome. Let's go get pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Feel bad for that delivery driver. That's a long route. <laughs> <laughs> that better be a good tip. Oh, cool. So the, oh, I'm going to paste another URL. The whole slide's all unpacked. Uh, I'm afraid my tar file doesn't include everything, which is just a mistake, but I can give you the, um, the URL that does contain everything, including the alien stuff there. Uh, and I have a blog, which if you hated this talk, you'll probably hate the blog also. <laughs> the uh, Oh, thanks. Yes, Theron has just pointed out that I, uh, I mistyped the URL. Anyway, there is the blog part that talks about the message to the aliens. 
Uh, and yes, thank you, Dave. That is the correct URL for the slides, I think. Yeah, that's looking good. I didn't have time. I, I didn't have time to get rid of all of the junk that's in the directory. So uh, you just want to start with start or with slide 001. And I think everything will just work. Usually I don't leave these things to the last minute as much as I, I did this one. And I was a little choppy this time, but man, it's been a, it's been a heck of a month for me. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. Mark, I don't see the URLs you're talking about. They are in the Zoom. They're in the chat. chat. Oh, okay. And uh, just in time, uh, 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 you know, uh, presentation creation, I suppose. My presentation creation what? Just in time, you know, the you know, uh, logistics methodology. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, man. <laughs> I was, I was literally finishing the installation of the software after seven o'clock. It was uh, horrifying. And yet it worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. Incredible, it worked. right? It's probably the most successful live demo ever given. So <laughs> I'm going to go out and I'm, my, my teenage daughter is going to be like, so dad, how did your talk go? Because that's how she says everything. And be like, it worked. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much. I'm going to go eat dinner now and uh, enjoy. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Mark. Me.